I'm going to play a sound, and I'd like you to raise your hand if you know which species of animal makes this sound. One more time. One? I'm impressed. <laughs> well, for the rest of you, that's Nictibius grandis, the largest species in the Potu family with a wingspan measuring just under a meter. At night, the great Potu flies about preying upon large insects and even bats. It is one of our strangest feathered friends. Let's play again. Raise your hand if you know which animal makes this sound. Just about everybody. That's Gaius domesticus, or the domestic chicken, as many of you probably guessed. No further explanation needed. These results don't surprise me. Today, our farm animals outnumber humans three to one. The biomass of just a handful of domestic poultry species is three times greater than that of all 11,000 species of wild birds. Humans and all that exists for our survival is supplanting the wild and all that is needed for its survival. Now, as a wildlife conservation biologist, it's particularly easy to villainize agriculture. I know I certainly did as I learned early on that agriculture is the primary cause of habitat loss, accounting for 90% of global deforestation. My personal introduction to tropical agriculture came as a bored passenger on long bus rides through Latin America. You see, agriculture occupies one-third of Latin America's land area, so I'd begrudgingly pass the hours counting the repeated rows on a hillside, or gazing out at the endless pasture lands. Occasionally, I'd even bird in these agricultural landscapes, but I quickly became disillusioned as I'd see the same diminished set of species over and over again. And then finally, respite from the agricultural monotony. I'd arrive at some amazingly biodiverse ecosystem like the Amazon, where one can see 150 different species in a morning of birding amongst dense primary jungle, oxbow lakes, and clay licks. I remember a mixed species flock that literally changed my life. I could hardly believe the colors flashing through the canopy or the melodious sounds that filled my ears. Sadly, the very existence of these amazing species is in peril. Wildlife abundance has declined by, by 70% in the last 50 years, and today, one in four species is classified as threatened or endangered. This is not just a concern for enthusiastic bird watchers like myself, but a concern for all of us. Biodiversity is critical to the food that we eat, the water that we drink, and the air that we breathe. So as I began to understand the importance of biodiversity, and I witnessed firsthand agriculture's devastating impact on it, I began to resent agriculture and even those who practiced it. Until I stayed with Oldemar and his family for a week. Oldemar was a coffee farmer living in the cloud forest of Monteverde, Costa Rica. For that week, I'd work the Sun Coffee Farm with Oldemar in the mornings, and I'd learn about the coffee production process in the evenings. Oldemar and his family were honest, hardworking, and extremely grateful for the small plot of land that they owned. So I left that farm feeling confused and conflicted. The environmental destruction caused by our food production system was perfectly clear. Yet I had just had this near magical experience with this incredible family that was entirely dependent upon agriculture for their existence. So I struggled for a while to reconcile these contradictory feelings. 
I combed through biology textbooks looking for an answer, but ultimately I gained perspective in a history book. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, I read. Indeed, European powerhouses set up shop in foreign lands to extract their resources and bring back unimaginable wealth to their home countries. But legacies of colonialism also establish the infrastructure required to process raw materials like timber, a culture and knowledge of resource extraction, and a population of colonizers ready to claim the terra nullius, Latin for nobody's land. Of course, this wasn't really nobody's land. And these expeditions led to the enslavement, displacement, and slaughter of countless indigenous groups. From a conservation perspective, these colonial voyages laid the groundwork for the commodity-based economies that continue to drive environmental degradation today, as exemplified by this mining operation on indigenous lands in the Brazilian Amazon. Reading between the lines of my history book, I reformulated the rhyme that I learned as a child. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and through and through, pillaging always ensued. Acknowledging this on-the-ground reality is critical when thinking about conservation in tropical nations. Traditional approaches to conservation have focused on setting aside strictly protected areas where no resource use or extraction is permitted. These models, sometimes called fortress conservation models, pit the preservation of nature against the economic well-being of the peoples inhabiting an area. Such models are strictly not viable when established communities depend on the land for their livelihoods. In fact, they can be considered a form of green colonialism that risks continued oppression of the inhabitants of tropical nations today. A recent year-long Fulbright grant to Columbia provided me with a transformative look at an alternative approach to conservation. I spent much of this year in the foothills of the easternmost chain of the Andes, in a hyper-biodiverse transition zone, with rugged mountains to the west, the rolling plains of the Llanos to the east, and the Amazon jungle to the south. I lived on farms and collected data with a field assistant, trying to understand how environmentally friendly approaches to cattle ranching influence bird diversity, which is a few examples of the species that we observed on these farms shown here. In particular, I studied silvopasture, or the incorporation of woody trees and shrubs in cattle ranching landscapes. This added vegetation is of economic value, fixes nitrogen, or serves as direct fodder for cattle, while simultaneously providing habitat for wildlife and storing carbon. In contrast to the fortress models of conservation, these land sharing models aim to benefit both humans and nature simultaneously. During my year in Colombia, I was also fortunate enough to partner with a multi-organizational, community-oriented conservation initiative entitled the Sustainable Cattle Ranching Project. Their primary goal was to assess the feasibility of establishing silvopasture across five unique regions of Colombia and understand its economic and conservation impacts. The initiative began in 2011 with town hall events to provide local communities with information about the project, as well as assess interest, receive feedback, and understand the community's concerns. A voluntary sign-up period ensued, followed by on-farm consultations with extensionists from the local communities. Here, the farmer and the extensionists would work collaboratively to come up with a plan that met the farmer's goals for their lands. 
trees were then delivered along with additional materials like electric wire and fence posts to help ameliorate the community's concerns over high startup costs. The extensionists return bi-monthly to check in and to continue training in areas that the farmers were interested in learning about. For example, if they wanted additional information on silage techniques or rotational practices, then that is what the extensionists would focus on. During the eight years of the project, over 24,000 farmers, extensionists, students, and professionals were trained in the implementation of silvopasture and its subsequent benefits. Throughout the project, Colombian scientists also collected data on biodiversity, deforestation, carbon sequestration, and farm productivity. The Sustainable Cattle Ranching Project now comprises the largest data set on silvopasture and its outcomes worldwide. And initial analyses show promising results. Farms that implemented silvopasture improved in all of these areas, including productivity. Silvopastoral farms had more and more nutritious forage, and cows showed increased milk production and nutrition, all while requiring less land to do so. And these on-farm changes translated into financial returns for farmers, which was particularly important for the 75% of project participants that were small-scale producers. In fact, over the eight-year life of the project, average farmer income increased by a factor of two to four, depending on the intensity of the civil pastoral systems that were implemented. I can't emphasize this point enough. Civil pasture was a win-win for both humans and nature in this pilot study. And now this is something that I can get excited about. Cattle ranching is the predominant anthropogenic land use worldwide, accounting for 70% 70, 70 of the total agricultural area. But, these principles, but the principles learned here can even go beyond just cattle ranching. Right here in British Columbia, we grow delicious grapes, berries, grains, tree fruits, and much more all of which could be done incorporating nat native vegetation into the landscape and reducing pesticide use. These changes are fundamental if we are to give biodiversity a fighting chance in the nearly one half of Earth's habitable landmass that's occupied by agriculture today. So as a conservation biologist, I'm excited by the massive landscape scale change that alternative agriculture could bring about. But as a human, it was the connections that I shared with extensionists, local biologists, farmers, and their families that was more powerful still. For example, in my year in Colombia, I shared my passion and knowledge for birds every opportunity that I could. Yet I learned at least as much from locals, even about birds, I remember one night getting up from the dinner table to walk back to my room when all of a sudden I heard this from above. I looked up and it was none other than Nictibius grandis, perched ominously in a nearby tree. I immediately ran back to grab the family to show them. When they saw the bird that I had just called Nictibius grandis, they laughed and said, that's la bruja, which means the witch in Spanish. I realized they knew la bruja quite well as they went on to explain that it got its name due to its eerie song and the shadows that it casts as it flies about on moonlit nights. It turns out that our different ways of knowing were complementary, not contradictory. I've covered several topics today. But there are three important messages that I hope you'll take home with you. First, and this is particularly important as a scientist from the global north, 
acknowledge, acknowledge the colonial roots that have led to present-day economic realities in tropical nations. Furthermore, recognize that conservation, particularly the fortress model, can exclude indigenous peoples and local communities from their land and actually reinforce legacies of colonialism. Second, listen to the communities where you work, respect local ways of knowing, and co-develop conservation solutions with communities to ensure their priorities are addressed and rights are respected. Finally, and only when there is desire from local communities, strengthen capacity that will remain in country. And you might as well start young. The owner of a plot of land may change, trees may get chopped down, but knowledge can never be stripped. And once ignited, the passion for nature and its conservation is rarely dampened. I hope you'll join me in the fight for a more sustainable and just future for all. Thank you.